I was perusing this article um, in uh, the, an older fine woodworking magazine and this magazine here. I'm not going to show you the goofball on the cover, but up in the right corner of issue number 278 is a little berry box. It says shaker berry box makes a great gift. And yes, it does. But what, in, what I like about that shaker berry box is that it features finger joints or box joints, which you can employ to make any kind of container you like. Also, you know, I was sitting on the sofa the other day and I looked over on this table and went, and it's funny, I never even noticed this box over there. And I saw it and I thought, wow, that looks pretty well made. Those look like finger joints. That reminds me of the berry box that I saw Chris Bexford did an article on. And I get close when I look at it and I thought, oh my gosh, this is really well made. Mm -hmm. That's a beautifully put together. And it turns out I asked the camera lady and it was a gift to us mm -hmm. at one of the epic weekends. And yes. you know who you are yes. who gave it to us. <laughs> and thank you so much. We love it. Yes. And it is the inspiration for tonight's little exploration into box yes, joints or you. finger joints. So the whole article, we're not going to go into the whole piece, but you can find it in issue number 278 of Fine Woodworking Magazine. Great little article. Chris Bexford's always got great articles. And, he, and he's like, I just like how he doesn't get hung up. It seems like he's he just nails it and gets right through it and in no nonsense, you know? So that's the way this project is. And it features some really interesting uses of materials in our, one of our new favorites, white pine. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if you're in the part of the country where you can't use it or find it as much, but you can substitute other uh, pines, I think. You're just gonna have to check the seasonal movement. We'll get to that later. We're gonna make, to start off, a finger joint jig for the table saw, on, for the crosscut saw. Now, this finger joint is really depends, the, the size you make your jig is dependent on how large you want the fingers. Here's a little sample board that I was messing around with today. So we've got the fingers, the fingers and the spaces between. So, this is the bottom here. So this is where I would start my cutting. So this initial finger is always going to be, or you always want it to be, the width of your gap. So you want to set up a dado blade or whatever to whatever width your fingers are going to be, okay? So you can make that however you like. Quite, quite often, it's the thickness of the material. So it, that's really what you want to get. So you cut your sockets as high as uh, the thickness of the material. And if you want a real blocky appearance, you can set up a dado the same thickness as your material. You don't have to, but that's what we did in this case. Because for this berry box, the side walls are very delicate eighth of an inch, which as it turns out, is typically the curve width of most carbide tip saws. So we're gonna head on over to the table saw in a second, but we're gonna make our teeth just like this. So we wanna set our first tooth to be right about an eighth of an inch, actually the curve cut. So let's head on over to the table saw and we'll do the first thing. The first thing is to just get a piece of three quarter inch plywood and square it up. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that long. It's just gonna sit on top of your crosscut sled. And we're gonna raise the blade in our, on our table saw a little over the thickness of our material, okay? And we'll make our first cut. So let's go over there and then we'll come right back to the bench and knock out this jig very fast. We want to set our saw blade height, as I mentioned, just above the thickness of our material. That's so that when these fingers interlock, they sit a little proud on the ends, and then you just have a little to clean off. 
It's a lot better to have the fingers proud and just skim plane those than have them be shy and then have to plane the entire side to get these fingers flush. It also helps in glue cleanup because you're going to inevitably get glue on this end grain and it's going to end up sitting proud and you'll just skim plane it flush. And it'll be clean and look awesome. All right. So for that, that means that we set our saw blade uh, just a 64th higher than this thickness. So that would make it 9 64ths. And note, I don't know, they must have missed it in the article, but everywhere it describes this, it ha they actually say 5 64ths, which would only be a 64th over a 16th. So they must be frustrated they missed that because I know how that happens and it's very frustrating. Uh, but so we've got our blade set. And what we're going to do, all you want to do is find the approximate center of your jig, your piece of plywood. Okay, I'm just about 20, so I'm just going to go right in here to 10. And I'm, I'm just going to make a saw cut. And this kerf is going to be our for our indexing pin, which I'll show you in a second. All right, what <laughs> beautiful, huh? We're almost done. All right, let's head back to the bench. <laughs> what I did was I thickness some um, maple. I wanted something pretty durable for the pin. This is the guide pin on which you're going to index to cut all those teeth, okay? So you'll make one initial cut, one of these cuts, and then this rests over the pin. But let me show you, it fits right in there nice and smooth okay so you want to size your material i don't know why this is a little slightly loose but just imagine it's perfect <laughs> uh, and then i cut on the bandsaw a shorter version all you need is a piece that sits in there and is about flush with the back and just sticks out about an inch and a half or so okay so i just take glue get some glue on there and then glue it in and let it set up and then you'll have a nice square pin indexing okay that's all you need to start with so just imagine no matter what kind of pins you're going to make you might have larger material you might be using plywood or something like that set up your dado cutter because you'll you may go thicker because you need to get it in just one pass and you'll make a groove just like that, whatever size it is. Then you're going to size your stock to the width of that, and that's going to become your indexing pin. All right? So then I would just glue that in, and that would be the indexing pin for me here because then the, when I'm cutting these teeth, it's going to rest over, and I'll cut each one referencing off that pin. But let me show you how that is because it's a little confusing until you see it. I think. So let's head over to the table saw. The typical saw blade I have, uh, I had on there. Oh, not that one. Makes a kind of V cut you probably know. So each other, every opposite tooth has a little bit of a flare. So when you see the bottom of the curve, it almost looks like cat's ears are sticking up in the corners. It's not flat across the bottom. So you have these like rising points. I don't think you're going to be able to see that here. Um, I would have to make a cut with it to show you. But I don't have one of those on here. I have a saw blade with what's called a number one grind. And the number one grind leaves a flat bottom curve. No cat's ears on that one. Okay, so it's giving me a perfect eighth inch with a nice bottom flat. That makes it easier. So it's almost like an eighth inch wide dado cutter. Here's the one I already have set up. It's already glued in. I wanted you to see this. And to set it up initially, if I have something that's exactly an eighth of an inch, they make these spacers from Lee Valley that I do have, but 
You know, you can also use the material. If, you, if your material fits snugly into that kerf when you glued it in, you can use a piece of that cutoff and you're gonna just set that in next to the pin and bring it up so it's right next to the saw blade, okay? So I'm just barely touching that saw blade. And then we're gonna lock in our fence. So let me do that right now. I'm gonna put a couple clamps on it. So this is just on table saw, no problem. Okay, so that's that. Now that's in a good spot and I had previously set up a stop so I could run these right off. Because what you're gonna do is run a test piece. And I didn't wanna go through that whole process with the test pieces, but you can see I've got some test pieces over here that I used earlier. So I start with that first corner. So I butt against my pin and I come up and I make the first pass, okay? So I'm left with about an eighth of an inch right on the end. I want this width to fit comfortably between the curve cuts, this initial width. So that gap is critical and that has to be set up. So after I do a whole series of cuts, then I'll make the cuts on the opposite piece and see how it comes together. This one, maybe that wasn't the one here. Yeah, this looks like it. Okay, so this one comes together, but it's a little loose and a little sloppy. So if it's loose, that means your pin, your initial, all of these pins are a little too narrow. So that means you need to move your fence slightly this way. So that's what I did. I just took off the stop. So have a stop on there. I took off the stop, put a piece of tape on it, brought the stop back up, took away this fence and then took off the tape and then put it. So essentially I moved it out one piece of tape and then it was perfect, okay? You can also sand, just sand the end of a piece a little, do whatever it takes until you dial that in so that after you run your test pieces, when it comes together, you're not fighting it. It, it has to be able to come together and it's not too loose. You need it to be easy to put together because you're gonna put a little glue in there. If you have too much glue in there, you're gonna get swelling and have a, an issue. So here are our parts that we're going to join. All right, I, I saw these out from a, a board of um, full length. So let's see, I, I numbered them too. So you, you can be nerdy like this and get the grain to sort of run. Now it's gonna be good across these, but then this corner is gonna match up with this corner and we're not gonna be so good. But oh, so what? One corner, not bad. <laughs> or you could just have material that didn't matter and not even worry about that. But I usually like to try to keep things organized like that. So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna actually bundle these together so we can make all the cuts at one time. Ooh, that makes it nice, nice and easy. Um, so in order to do that, we wanna make sure we bundle them so that we're cutting the, the right hand corner of all of these because then we'll come back and cut the left hand corner from your vantage point. And that's gonna be offset by the thickness of the tooth or the, the saw curve. It's going to be altered so that everything that is positive on this end is going to be a negative on the other end and it'll lock together and we'll be pretty close to flush around the bottom, okay? So let's start out. I'm gonna cut this, this corner first and these will all be oriented together and then we'll offset and come back and cut the other corner. So I'll just keep them in order like that with the small one. Now this is where I gotta get them nice and accurately bundled together so that everything fits flush and I'm not, oops, what's in there? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> takes a little bit, you wanna get this right, okay? 
But think of the time you're saving. You're not going to have to run all four. Okay, so now I got them flush, and I'm going to just put a couple pieces of tape on there, keep them in place. One piece of tape. <laughs> Two piece of tape. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, now I got my bundle ready. I'm flush on the bottom and flush at the end. And this will be indexing off of my guide tooth. Okay, we're gonna come over. And we're gonna butt right up to the tooth, okay? So we make our first cut just like that. And what that's gonna do is give us hopefully the exact spacing there. I'm trusting that my stop is in the right place. Uh, now, what I'm gonna do is make that first cut. I'll have the eighth inch tooth, then I'm gonna just jump up and set on and go right on across. It'll be super easy and once, once I do both sides, you'll understand if you've never seen this. Here we go. Okay, see how that worked? The last one's like a half tooth. Um, I could rip these off after if I wanted to leave a full tooth. Whatever you want to do, you can leave it small as well. Uh, so there you have it. If I, I don't know if I mentioned if it, if your um, if your tooth it's too tight and it's not coming together, you would just remove this, put a piece of tape, and then butt it. So you're adjusting however thick or small. The tooth is okay so that's it that's that's all four sides now we're going to hit the other side so this is the top i'm referencing off the bottom here so let me uh let me take this scrap piece here and what i'm going to do before i bundle these is i'm going to make that initial cut with this scrap piece okay so i'm going to come over here and i'm butting up against the tooth and this is going to give me my space there. Okay. I've got one over here, but I want to make sure I use that one. All right, so now we can bundle our stock together again. And we're going to do it for the other end. So we just drop it down. So let's go ahead and get our tape on there. All right. There we are, nice and flush. All right, so this one, we're gonna come in here, and remember, if we just come up here and butt in, we're gonna end up with the exact same tooth at the end, and they will not interlock. So we have to cut that first space. We want to push this over the thickness of our tooth. So we're gonna use that initial cut there that we made like this. That's our little test cut. We're turning this around and we're gonna put it over the pin. Okay, that's gonna give us a perfect reference to come in. I got my tape in there, but that'll be all right. And there it is, that's our first cut. Okay, so let me put my gear on. Here we go.
All right, let's head back to the bench and see if it worked. I sure hope it did. So once you have them all cut out like this, let's get them in our order. Here's one and four, two, okay. So there we are, that's the order we had them. So now we can bring one and two up. Let's just see, ah, nice. Goes together, it's not tight, but that's okay, because the glue's gonna swell it up a little bit. And then we'll come into three. We'll just do a dry fit, nice. And four. Make sure everything goes together. All right, so that's a good gap situation there. And we're going to now glue them up. So let's just glue this up quickly and I'll show you how that goes. So that's one, two, tres, four. So you can see once you have your setup, if you've got whatever material you're using, plywood, whatever, run a bunch of stock, run all your parts, whatever, you get them all sized for your boxes. You set up that tooth system there and you are ready to cut some finger joints all day long. You just lock them out. Then you have a little glue up party and you're gonna have amazing boxes. Like making this basket is not that time consuming once you get your parts. You could, you could make them quite, quite efficient. All right, so now I'm gonna start spreading glue and I've got them all organized according to number here. One up through four and I'm gonna be doing it from the inside. It's kind of an awkward situation to spread glue on, but, um, and I've got my new rag. Look at that. So we're gonna go on to these teeth and I'm just gonna squeeze while I bump across and just come back both ways and get a bead and it's gonna to start to kind of settle down in there. It's, it's crazy to get it all in between each teeth. I'm gonna do it with the brush in a second. But I just wanna get this on pretty fast on each one and you want to use usually when you're gluing up finger joints or dovetails you want to use a glue that does not set fast so it has what's called open time better open time so you can do that with a uh, uh, white glue or here I'm using type on three which has a little longer open time and the standard, but you know, small project like this, and it's not super hot right now, I could get by with the uh, regular type bond too. Type bond as well, I didn't mean type bond too. Um, so, all right, so almost there. And that's that, okay. So now I'm gonna just take the brush and Try to improve that just a little. Get a little glue on the brush and then come down. And those little beads, I'm gonna try to drag them and just smear them so that it's starting to run down the inside of those teeth. Get a little bit in there. I know there's probably a better way to do this, but that's my method and I'm sticking to it. I actually haven't done a lot of, uh, I remember doing this probably twice before. It's not a common joint for furniture, you know. For little boxes and items like this, it's perfect. But uh, it's really fun. I mean, this would be one, this would be a fun one to do with kids because you could introduce them to the table saw with a project like this. Pretty, uh, not, not very intimidating. And then you put them together. It's you have something, you know, it's, it's really a set up your materials. You could do this, make these boxes in a day. You know, once you had all your materials set up a weekend, you could definitely crank them out. Okay. So that's looking pretty good. See, I'm starting to get a little, you get a little tiny drop going down in between. That's the goal. That's what I'm aiming for. I think I missed that one. No, okay, here we are. I'm gonna clean off my fingers. Now we're gonna assemble 
wipe them on your pants. Good to go. <laughs> All right, make sure I got these, you know, one and two. Ah, yeah, see, it feels a little sn more snug now. Here we go. Two and three. Beautiful. Yeah, glue squeezing out. That's a good sign. And here comes four. Just keep it flat on the table and they should line up. Last corner. Oh, it's so satisfying, huh? All right, so well, I'm pinching the corners. And you just want to do this and stand there for 45 minutes. No, just kidding. You're going to just, no, you're going to pinch it. And Don, Don says he tapes the inside so he doesn't have to try to clean up the squeeze out. I know. Don, I was trying for no squeeze out. Actually, uh, you, that's a, a good idea. You can tape the inside if you like. Um, I like to let it gel and then I just skim it. Hopefully, after you do a few of them, you get the right feel for the amount of glue. Or you can take a, a damp rag after it's set a little bit, scrape up, and then you usually don't end up with too much in a case like this if you're judicious with the glue. Now, on a practice run earlier, while it was dry, I didn't have any glue in there. I just taped around each corner with the green tape stretching around and you can use that method it took me a little time you know to get three pieces of tape on each one if i had looser fingers i would be concerned with that but if they're pretty snug you can start to feel the glue grabbing and by just pinching it tight if your joints are snug enough that you can feel it pull up and then you don't see it recede at all. You still see them up tight in the middle. You actually can get away without even clamping these because they're seating. You have a lot of glue surface there and you're getting the tack effect, but make sure that the fingers are seated. You don't want gaps in between your fingers like and the other side. I'm sighting it for square right now, trying to see if it looks pretty square. So, like I said, you can do the tape, but it, it takes a little time. I, you could set up some system where you could clamp the corners, but because this isn't square, it's you can't really do it diagonally or it'll keep wanting to knock out a square, and you'd have to set up some kind of blocks. If you were in production here, you would you would probably set up a system where you could very quickly do it. Uh, but in this case, these fingers are staying up. So after a couple times around, it looks good. So now I'll take the square and check it. I'm just going to check it with a little square on the inside. This stock is really true. Wow. That actually was that corner spot on. Hopefully. Yeah, that's good. It's square. So I'm going to, I would just let it chill out now. Don't touch it. And now it's so light and it's crazy how light it is. It's just white pine. And it's only eighth of an inch, but you've got all of that joint um, interlocking on the corners. It's pretty satisfying for a little piece like this. That's why it makes such sweet containers and a box to carry. I mean, if you could feel this, if you've not felt these, it's quite light. Yeah. Now, one of the interesting features that you can do with a box like this is, you notice we haven't even done anything with the bottom. The material is so thin, we're not gonna cut a dado around or a groove around the inside and then put a bottom in. If you were thicker, you could do that. But for this project, Chris Bexford calls for, and this is the way the shakers used to do it. They would glue a solid panel of quarter sawn white pine to the bottom. So even though it's solid, because it's quarter sawn and white pine, you've got the most, as he describes it, well-behaved wood in this country. It, is, it moves the least with seasonal movement of any material, any softwood and hardwood. So, 
If you have the quarter sawn version, you're getting even less movement across there. So if you have a board wide enough, this is interesting. It looks like, looks like he had a, uh, a solid board, beautiful quarter sawn on that bottom there. Beautiful mm. choice of material right there. Now, if you don't have a just, wide board with um, quarter sawn material, you can take a piece like this. So here we've got a plain sawn piece of a quarter, but you can see it's plain sawn, so it's arcing like that. So if you can flatten one side and then join an edge, then you can go to your bandsaw whoops, and make some cuts like this. Okay, so you're making cuts and you're gonna start getting into rift. That's where it starts getting angled, but that's still pretty stable material right there. And I like to make an, an arrow so that I can reassemble them and then glue them up right side by side. Just slip them aside and glue them up. Let me show you some that I cut a little earlier that I would do that with. Here's some right here, right from that same board, okay? So there's my arrow. That's the sequence that they were resawn in. So the bottom that he calls for is a quarter inch thick. So this was resawn. And this is a good example of the way I made that small eighth inch thing as well. So look, it's, it's a, a full 30 second more than a quarter of an inch. So I just join an edge, go to the bandsaw and I run that through. Then I joint that edge again, then I run it through. So I just do a circle between the joiner and the bandsaw until I've got all my pieces. Then I go to the sander and I just put my jointed side down and I sand them. But actually in this case, before I sand them, I glue them up because I can then sand them to thickness when they're all glued up and it'll save me some time. So look, I got them in this order. That's the exact order. So I'd bring them in. Let's look at this side. It's a little easier to see. And for this, I'm just going to use a slip match and it matches up quite well. So then on the ends, you can see you end up with a beautiful quarter sawn board that it'll be hard to see the seams after this is glued up. So this gets glued up and then run through the drum sander or you could even hand plane it after that point. Pine is a pleasure to plane. And you're gonna have beautiful quarter sawn material. So here's a piece that's already glued up and I ran it through the drum sander. Now I would just quickly skim plane it before cutting it to size and gluing it under the box. So let me show you what I did a little earlier. Here's my first box earlier. I've got, this one was glued up about two hours ago and it's stabilized and it's nice and square, but I didn't clamp it. And look, look at how those are seated. You can see that you really just want to make sure there were all the fingers were seated. All I did was squeeze it like I showed you and they held in there. Once you could, you could tell they weren't going to move. Now it's solid and we're good to go. If I was to put this bottom on right away, I won't put it on, but I'll show you. I would just take a block plane and go around. Tom Carlo's asking, would the no clamping method work with thicker stock? Uh, You'd have to test it. Uh, the main thing is you just got to get those fingers up tight enough. I think as you go thicker, you might find it's a little more. You, you have to hit that sweet spot of, of the fit. You know, the fit would have to be just right that once the glue hit it, the fingers weren't too loose. Okay, so I'm just holding this flat and just going around. And um, I think I got enough there. So there we go. Nice and true. And that will be the bottom. And I cut another piece earlier and I hand planed one face. It's under the magazine. All right, so I hand planed and I cut this piece to size. So this is the same thickness. And it's just a little bit larger than it needs to be. So this surface is planed, that edge is planed, this will go down, 
and look at that. We'll, we'll just put some glue and for this, I would just bring it over like this and you could tape here and then put some clamps in the corners. You know, this is the kind of project once you set up, you may, you'll, it'll occur to you like a clever way to glue these up quickly. Like this, this could just, if you had a heavy enough weight that was a big block, you could just put a weight on that. That would hold it because it's nice and flat and you don't need a lot. That's, everything's flat. The bottom, the quarter sawn, look at that quarter sawn across that. And that was glued up from three boards. So that would make a wonderful bottom. No problem with seasonal movement there. Um, the shakers use it all the time for bottoms of things, even pieces that were up to like 12 inches wide with no problem. Are you going to talk about finish? Uh, it looks like it might be a Danish oil or you could just, uh, you could put shellac, but I think it's just like a Danish oil or something. Do a little test for it and it'll darken and get warm like that in not much. I would go with the clear, not the amber, and because the amber is in the pine and it'll warm up over time. You put just a touch, but no orange. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little journey down container making lane. <laughs> uh, I love this little project. Something about it just feels great in the spring and super fun to make. And remember, uh, we've got that in issue number 278. Hey, if you like this content, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe, and head on over to epicwoodworking.com and check out the neighborhood. You can be part of our, you can move into the neighborhood yes. and be one of our insiders. All right. Hey, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We couldn't do it without you. We wouldn't do it without you, but <laughs> makes it a rich community. So, hey, we look forward, the camera lady and I, to seeing you next time.